Good morning and welcome to our pinning ceremony that we've been uh, anticipating and we're thrilled to be able to celebrate together today with our practical nursing graduates. Uh, just a couple of announcements before we start the ceremony uh, this morning. First of all, this afternoon at 2 o'clock, there's a graduation and all of the nurses will also be involved in that. It's in the ARDAC, the gymnasium over here, and that is at 2 o'clock. So we welcome you back for that uh, wonderful event at 2 o'clock this afternoon. Now, uh, this ceremony will, uh, for the most part, be without introductions. We will make a few introductions, but there is a program. So if uh, most of you hopefully got that, but if not, there are some at the back, and feel free to pick that up uh, so that you can follow along as we move through the ceremony today. Now, this is the all-important announcement. If you're looking for a washroom, they are in the building exactly... Now, that is south. So just go through the doors at the back, turn left, go about 10 meters, and there's a door right into the Maxwell Center and there will be washrooms there. Now, this after or this morning, they, we want to give ample opportunity for you to have uh, photos. So you'll want to get out your phone and put it on silent or put it on vibrate, but keep it out so that you can get the photos that you want. Now, uh, just to make sure that you know, we do have a professional photographer, Nicole, at the back, and uh, she's going to be taking photos. Those are going to be uploaded uh, to the Prairie Facebook page, so they will be available for you, but you may want to catch your own, and uh, especially when your graduate is here at the front, uh, you may even want to make your way down here in order to capture that uh, snap. Now, we used to say snap. That's a, a bygone age. Sorry. <laughs> I'm an old man. So uh, now Nicole is going to, uh, she mentioned she'd like to grab one first. And then once she's grabbed her, she'll give you the thumb, thumbs up so that you can go ahead. And we wanted, again, we want to make ample opportunity for you to get the picture that you want. And then at the end, again, we'll have another opportunity for photos. Um, I think... We're going to uh, proceed then right into the processional. And uh, so we're delighted that you can celebrate together with us the 2022 pinning ceremony. I should have mentioned that exuberant cheering is allowed in this ceremony. <laughs> uh, would you uh, join me as we begin our ceremony today with a prayer? Gracious and loving God, we are grateful 
that you are a healer. And the evidence of the Bible is that when you came into our neighborhood through Jesus, that you had compassion on people and you healed the sick. We thank you that each of these graduates have committed themselves to follow you into a world of sickness to bring hope and help through serving others as your hands and feet. Thanks that we are able to meet together in person to celebrate their achievements this morning, and I ask that these graduates will feel a great sense of your smile in their lives. Help them to live out the commitments that they will make this morning with great joy and fulfillment. And may you be honored in this service. We commit it to you, and we do it in Jesus' name. Amen. Since the inception of the practical nursing program at Prairie, the program and the faculty have been provided by Bow Valley College. Bow Valley College has its main campus in downtown Calgary, and it is one of the largest, maybe the largest, and most reputable practical nursing providers in Canada. This partnership is a unique linking of a public college and a private college in which Bow Valley has been willing to work with Prairie to deliver a practical nursing program in a Christian faith-based environment. As far as I know, the only faith-based PN program in Canada. The practical nurse program then com combines an accredited biblical uh, theological uh, foundation with an accredited practical nursing training. So learners, these learners, who successfully complete the program receive both a diploma in ministry from Prairie as well as a practical nurse diploma from Bow Valley College. Now, I am delighted this morning to welcome uh, Janet Yorkey, who is the Dean of the School of Health and Wellness at Bow Valley College, to bring comments and greetings. Now, just before uh, Janet comes, I'm not sure if Petrina is here. Not yet. Well, if she comes later, I'll make sure that I... Uh, introduce her as well. But welcome, Janet. We're so grateful that you could join us today. Thanks, Glenn, for that uh, very nice introduction. And good morning, everybody. It's a fine day for a pinning ceremony and a graduation. I'm excited to be here, and I'm delighted to have the opportunity to share a few words. Congratulations, PN graduates. You have worked hard to reach this day. You have shown resilience and hope to have completed a nursing program during a pandemic. Well done. My wish for each of you is a strong and healthy beginning to a career that will take you places you never imagined. It is your knowledge, creativity, and curiosity that will get you thinking about where those places might be. Patricia Benner, which I'm sure our PN graduates know, and others said that good nursing practice requires knowledge, skill, and character. We can teach knowledge and skill, but we, can we teach character? The term character is not commonly used in the nursing world, as we are so very focused on learning our healthcare lingo uh, to pass exams and to be, a great to be a great nursing student. It is, however, the challenges on how we handle ourselves, also how we capture the value from these concrete experiences that is crucial to helping nurses learn what it means to be a good team member in a nursing um, and healthcare environment. Much of you have heard over the past two years spoke about professionalism, ethics, and competencies. It's really how you combine these three areas as a nurse that determines your character. I will share with you a bit of my experience that supported my journey to be here today. Nursing wasn't my first career of choice. I always had this longing to be a nurse 
But after graduating high school, my path took a very different turn. My first career began in insurance, where I served others to ensure their most valued items were properly insured. I started out as a filing clerk. Yes, we filed papers. There wasn't computers just quite ready to go then. <laughs> At the end of my career insurance, I was a part owner of an agency. I then went back to school, beginning my journey in nursing. I studied hard and worked hard. I was in, in various settings, long-term care, paramedical, surgical nursing, and teaching. I truly believe that all these life experiences, good or bad, has shaped the person I am today. And it is the life experiences and lessons learned that I brought my good nursing character. It is particularly important, of course, that my nursing character be strong and knowledgeable, but mostly good. Let's not let the simplicity of the word good diminish the impact for us. In order to function within a world of healthcare, good nursing character can mean listening. Good nursing character can mean allowing others to speak first, while you listen to ideas that may change the direction of an illness. Advocacy. Good nursing character can mean that you speak out in times of need to advocate for your patients. Caring. Good nursing character may mean that you present your best self each and every day to patients, family members, and your colleagues throughout your nursing career. By bringing that good nursing character each day, we together can build a quality healthcare system. You are embarking on a journey in a career that brings privilege. You will have the privilege to care for others and support them through some of the darkest moments in their life and maybe some of the happiest moments as well. You will be the bright light that will make a difference with even the smallest of gestures, a smile. Before I close off, I do want to acknowledge the faculty and staff at both Prairie College and Bow Valley College. This team of professionals have been dedicated to your success and we owe them a big thank you. I know that each of you will make a difference and do some amazing things. I ask one thing, always keep your heart open and to make that difference in the people's lives that are in your care and trust. Thank you, and have a wonderful day. Well, thank you, Janet. Petrina, when she gets the word, thank you. Thank you to Bow Valley. I want to echo also a couple of other things of Glenn's. Welcome to all of you. We're delighted that you're here. Congratulations to all of you. I know that's just echoing, and you may say it doesn't need to be repeated. For me, it does. Uh, but it's a delight to have you here. I want to take one extra thing, and that is to invite you to our centennial this summer. Some of you are here this morning and may not be here this afternoon, but you're all invited, especially our Bow Valley friends. We're grateful for you as friends and partners, and we've got a, par a party coming up in July, 13 to 17, four major events e each evening. There's some mediocre speakers in the morning, myself and faculty, <laughs> skip those. Um, but in the evening, we've got major rallies with Phil Calloway and Charles Price and Dan Cochran and people like that, and then four concerts that are following it. It is going to be a great time, July 13. Put it on your calendar. We hope you will be here. I'd like to take this opportunity and it's brief, to uh, give a verse to the, 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 the PN students as you're at this point. And, you know, I know you may just whoosh, go, oh, man, shut him up. But, I, you know, I, each year I try and f figure out what would be a good verse that would fit for this class. And this time I settled in on a couple of verses from Matthew uh, 5, which is out of the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus was talking to sort of a probable crowd of, of friends and followers. And he said, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is of no good to anyone except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. 
Then he followed, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a hide a lamp. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a, br a bowl instead of letting it out and let it stand and give its light to everyone in the house. In the same way, and here's my verse for you, let your light shine before others. Why? That they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. That is my best wish for you, and I believe it will stand you well. Let your light shine. It is also my privilege to introduce our guest uh, speaker this morning. Now, sadly, he came down sick. So we got it recorded, and it's going to be coming in by video. My guess is he is online, Dr. Savage. Warm greetings to you. I guess you're right there. Uh, and we wish you well in your recovery. But here is um, our guest, our keynote speaker this morning. Dr. Luke Savage was born and raised in Alberta. He did his medical training and residency in Edmonton before starting practice in Three Hills in 2010. Following in the Hippocratic tradition, his practice focuses on low-risk obstetrics and palliative care and everything in between from conception to natural death. Dr. Savage serves, serves on the board of directors for the Big County, Big Country, my bad, Big Country Primary Care Network, and nationally on Canadian Physicians for Life. He was on the CPSA Council from 2017 to 2020. He is a clinical associate professor at both University of Calgary and University of Alberta. And in 2018, he earned the Clinical Teaching Award for the Resident Doctors of Alberta. Dr. Savage enjoys cycling and being outdoors, time with his wife and four school-aged children, and connecting with community through faith and sports events. And we consider you a good friend and partner, Dr. Savage. Are you here? Oh, that's the, that's the camera. You, Dr. Savage. <laughs> let's, let's roll that film. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, graduates and staff. Thank you for inviting me to speak today. It is an unexpected honor and pleasure to be here to celebrate with you, albeit uh, by video. Uh, my name is Dr. Savage. I work at the Three Hills Hospital here and I've been in Three Hills for 12 years and I guess you could call me a friend of Prairie College. Now your class is quite unique. You're the first class to have your entire training during COVID times. You don't know what it's like to work in healthcare before COVID Although no doubt you will hear that phrase countless times in the months ahead. Now I'd like to take the time given me to give you some words of encouragement as you embark on this noble calling. But I hope to also infuse it with some reality and truth. It doesn't do anyone any good to sugarcoat things. Yes, this is a time for celebration, but it's also time for a reality check. First off, you guys aren't done yet. You've still got a few months left before those big finals and practicum evaluations and paperwork required by the nursing college. But there's a light at the end of the tunnel, isn't there? And it's getting bigger and bigger. The tricky part is that this is just one stage or chapter in your journey. After you are all done with Prairie, and I'm sure Mark would say, we hope you're never done with Prairie, but you'll move on to the next chapter with its own set of responsibilities, learnings, and duties. So in some ways, it never ends. Life carries on. So I'd like to pass on some wisdom for the journey, no matter what chapter you're in. Now let's start by passing out some bookmarks. I made a little gift for you guys, and they're right here. So whoever has that envelope, please take it around. Now there's enough, obviously, for all the grads, and also... A few extras for the teachers of the nursing program and certainly the guests from Bow Valley College uh, and perhaps the others that are involved in the program. You, if there's some extras, go ahead and take them up. Now, this bookmark serves several purposes. First off, it's a bookmark, obviously. Um, and what you'll notice is that there's a nice little picture of the sunset saying Prairie College on it. You're kind of going off into the sunset in some ways. But on the other side, there's a picture of a journey ahead with a lot of words. Now, if you have trouble reading this, you probably need some glasses and it's time to get an eye exam. So that's another part of the bookmark. 
But this quote on here from Thomas Sydenham uh, is one that I will focus on for the rest of my talk here. So there we go. Let's, uh, let's get to it. So Thomas Sydenham, I'll just mention briefly if those bookmarks are still getting passed out. Thomas Sydenham was a doctor oh, almost 400 years ago in the mid 1600s. And he's considered the father of modern English medicine. Uh, in some ways, similar to Florence Nightingale, who is the, the mother of nursing, in a sense. So, uh, yeah, so we'll, let's uh, get on to his quote here, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll talk a little more. So here's what it says. This is four things to consider. It becomes every man who purposes to give himself to the care of others seriously to consider the four following things. First, that he must one day give an account to the supreme judge of all the lives entrusted to his care. Secondly, that all his skill and knowledge and energy as they have been given him by God, so they should be exercised for his glory and the good of mankind and not for mere gain or ambition. Thirdly, and not more beautifully than truly, let him reflect that he has undertaken the care of no mean creature, for in order that he may estimate the value, the greatness of the human race, the only begotten Son of God became himself a man, and thus ennobled it, in, excuse me, ennobled it with his divine dignity, and far more than this, died to redeem it. And fourthly, that the doctor, or nurse, being himself a mortal man, should be diligent and tender in relieving his suffering patients, inasmuch as he himself must one day be a like sufferer. Now that was written in 1668. And that was before stethoscopes, before blood pressure cuffs, before antibiotics, before a lot of things we enjoy in, t in modern medicine. Back then, you know, it was, it was probably a lot tougher than, than now. You would just had to use your powers of observation and comforting the patient and, and easing them in whatever malady they might have. Now, I've tried to summarize Thomas Sydenham's uh, quote there into four basic principles and I think they come down to these ones transcendence charity dignity and compassion now each of these could be a lecture unto themselves or several so buckle up all right so it doesn't take long these days to see how our healthcare system in the western world is broken we focus on reactive treatments of disease rather than proactive treatment of, for health there are staffing shortages everywhere Many people cannot get a doctor or see one within a reasonable time frame. Wait times for surgeries and cancer care are prolonged, leading to more symptoms and increased suffering. Nursing staff are overworked and burnt out. I've talked to many that are afraid to go to the hospital for fear of being separated from loved ones due to inhuman policies that limit visitors in times of need. You graduates are entering an uphill battle. And it will grind you down if you're not grounded in a firm foundation with good community supports around you. Now, thankfully, the program you've been going through here at Prairie has taken this into account. The battle you're embarking on is a noble one and can be overcome if you are focused on the right things. And it starts with the principles that Thomas Sydenham identified some 400 years ago. If every healthcare professional kept these principles near and dear to their hearts every day, we would have a dramatically transformed healthcare system. Indeed, our hospitals, clinics, and care homes would be places of true healing for the whole person, not just places of disease care in a broken system, but true healthcare and joyful living. Now, let me show you how by expanding a little bit on these concepts further. And a little later this morning, Jan will lead you through your nurse's pledge, which has many of these same principles. So see if you can pull them together and find the parallels. So firstly, Dr. Sydenham says, we must one day give an account to the supreme judge of all the lives entrusted to our care. Now, I think this is summarized in the principle of transcendence, of something beyond what we just see. Uh, but our culture would probably use a word like accountability. But really it starts, I think, with transcendence. There are moral consequences to our actions. This implies that we are responsible for the choices we make and the quality of care that we provide. We must give an account for what we do. In the secular world, the professional colleges take on this role 
embodied through guidelines and procedures and policies. I've heard you've learned lots about those. And you'll get to know ROPs or required organizational practices. Yeah. But this quality control is only activated if someone complains or finds you out. And furthermore, it's subject to the ruling authorities of the day. So colleges can change their standards and governments can also get involved. And the fear of reprisal from a professional organization is an imperfect deterrent to poor conduct. If people do not have a higher standard, they just try to find loopholes and ways around rules that slow them down. And in the nursing context, this might manifest itself in getting the job done as quickly and efficiently as possible, sometimes cutting corners and not getting caught. And in the caring professions, this is a dangerous way to proceed. Now throughout history, there's a longing for justice and whispers of a higher standard that is known by all, even if it is not recognized by all. So this first principle of transcendence tells us that we will be not be judged by our peers or professional colleges or governments, but no less than by the supreme judge and creator of the universe. Now, the writer of Hebrews states, it's appointed once to die, then the judgment. And in 2 Corinthians, we read that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. The thought of all our deeds, actions, words, and thoughts being laid bare can be scary. We are subject to the creator's absolute standard of right and wrong. But far from a terrifying experience, the creation around us sings for joy and longs for God's justice. We all have a deep longing or ache for things to be set right, for justice to be done. In Psalm 96, we read, Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord. This sounds like a big party. And what for? Well, for he comes. For he comes to judge the earth. He will, he will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. Several other Psalms have similar refrains. God will judge the world with righteousness and equity. We don't know exactly when that will be, but it seems sooner with every passing day. Now those who love God and are covered by Christ's forgiveness have nothing to fear. And if that doesn't make sense to you, please talk to one of the profs here, and I'm sure they will be happy to explain this further. Bottom line is, our conduct will be subject to evaluation by the ultimate authority. We will give an account to the lives entrusted to our care. The second principle from Sydenham is that of what I've called charity. He says, Secondly, that all his skill and knowledge and energy, as they've been given him by God, so they should be exercised for his glory and the good of mankind and not for mere gain or ambition. Now, what I mean by charity is an older definition. It's not an organization you donate to, but it's one that you yourselves are, are that entity that engages to help others and use your skill and your own goodwill. Merriam-Webster's dictionary defines it as generosity and helpfulness, especially towards the needy and suffering, and benevolent goodwill toward or love of humanity. Charity is one of these words that is losing its meaning, usually replaced with love. But real love is not merely a feeling, but a commitment to one another. That's what Terry Glaspie said uh, on reflecting on C.S. Lewis's work. Now, it takes a special person to be a nurse. And it's often a thankless job, and you get to see humanity at their most vulnerable and needy, and sometimes at their most cranky and critical. There are easier ways to make a buck. And of course, that's not why you are entering into this calling. Paul tells us in Colossians that, in whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Or in the message translation, it's read as, keep in mind that all... Sorry, keep in mind always that the ultimate master you're serving is Christ. So to be a good nurse and to be able to continually enjoy what you do and not get burnt out, you need to have the same servant attitude that Christ had. He helped others because he loved them, 
but not just affectionate feelings, and rather it was a deep commitment and concern for their well-being. And he loves us, despite what we do or how we respond. And Jesus knew many would turn away and forget him. Now just think of the ten lepers in Luke 17. As Jesus and his disciples were traveling near the border of Samaria, ten lepers from a village came out crying for mercy. After being shut out of community for who knows how long, but Jesus knows, they were desperate for help, desperate enough to potentially break the law. Now the old Mosaic law from the Old Testament required anyone with leprosy or other infectious diseases to be outcasts, walking around calling unclean, unclean, and to live outside the camp or the village. Now being shut out of community, while it might help to isolate a disease, isolates the soul and wears one down, proclaiming to everyone over and over that you are unclean eventually seeps into one's identity. Isolation can be a death sentence if it's prolonged. But these lepers, rather than call out unclean, they called out for mercy. They knew where to look for help. And Jesus doesn't heal them on the spot. He just directs them to show themselves to the priest. Now the law at that time required that the priest examine and declare that someone with a rash or illness was healed. And then sacrifices and a cleansing process had to be made before returning to the community. So these ten lepers call out for mercy. Jesus doesn't heal them right away, but they have enough faith to start heading towards the priest. Now just imagine this for a minute here. On their way, they notice that their skin is starting to improve. Their leprosy is going away. Now it's interesting that leprosy is the disease used here. I know it might be something different depending on the accuracy of translation, but for the sake of this illustration, let's go with leprosy. Back then, it was like a death sentence. It's something that you or I will likely never see, but it would be similar to having a diagnosis of stage four cancer in our time, in terms of, of the prognosis and the devastation it could bring. Now, leprosy is caused by a bacteria that slowly, dissolve, or, sorry, slowly destroys nerve cells so that patients cannot feel pain. So interestingly, these 10 lepers would be seeking healing not so much from their physical pain, since they couldn't feel any, but more so from the psychological pain their condition had brought. We can only imagine the relief and incredible hope that would have sprung up in them as they realized their skin was healed. Maybe one of them stepped on a sharp rock and actually felt a stab of pain in his foot. Maybe another started feeling arthritis pain in his knees for the first time as he walked. But as these new sensations started to flood their brains, another realization dawned on them. They could get their lives back. They could move back to town, maybe go and hug their family for the first time in two, five, maybe ten years. They could get close and touch people. To imagine this transformation, just imagine someone with stage four cancer telling, being told it's inoperable and then being healed. You may say something, you, you may see something like that. I have, and there are no words other than praise God. And if you keep your eyes open, you will see miracles. So back to the story with this newfound realization and joy, what do the lepers do? Well, we don't really know. Uh, the author, Luke, doesn't tell us. We don't even know if they went to see the priest. Although I would assume so, because the priest would give them the go-ahead for cleansing and reintegration with community. But here's the whole point of bringing up this account. Only one of the ten lepers came back to Jesus. He actually turns around halfway to the priest and come back, comes back to say thank you. He falls down at Jesus' feet and worships. And we're told he's a Samaritan, probably the least likely to talk to a Jew or ever give thanks to one, let alone bow down. Now, Oswald Chambers has said, if we are devoted to the cause of humanity, we shall soon be crushed and brokenhearted, for we shall often meet with more ingratitude from men than we would from a dog. But if our motive is love for God, no ingratitude can hinder us from serving our fellow men. And that's what it's like in healthcare. Most people will walk away 
happy and get on with their lives no matter how good you treat them. A few will say thank you or even come back and give you a, a thank you card. But that's not why we care for others. That's not why Jesus healed the lepers. He did it out of love and mercy. And we do it because he did it out of love and mercy. Micah 6, 8. What does the Lord require? To act justly and love mercy and walk humbly with God. Because we're all called to do everything for God's glory and to point others to him. Now, how do you do this when you're seeing the worst of human behavior and its consequences? Well, that could be another talk. Uh, but C.S. Lewis gives us a hint in mere Christianity. He says, the rule for all of us is perfectly simple. Do not waste time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Act as if you did. As soon as we do this, we find out one of the great secrets. When you are behaving as you love someone, you will presently come to love him. Now, our third principle I call dignity or sanctity of life. So let me repeat what Sidonam says there, and you have it on your bookmark. Thirdly, and not more beautifully than truly, let us reflect that we've undertaken the care of no mean creature, for in order that we may estimate the value, the greatness of the human race, the only begotten Son of God became himself a man, and thus ennobled it with his divine dignity, and far more than this died to redeem it. Wow. It leaves you speechless. Well, hum humans are an amazing creation, the pinnacle of God's handiwork. And in Genesis, creation was not deemed very good until humans were created. In Psalms, we are described as a little lower than the angels and crowned with glory and honor. Out of all creation, we humans have the imago dei. Uh, probably pronounced that wrong, but someone can correct me later. <laughs> the image of God imprinted within us. No other animal or landscape or force of nature has God's image. Now, there are many incredible things that point to God, but only humans have his image. And add to that fact that God came down to earth in human form, and that should stop us in our tracks in awe and wonder. Of all the forms, ordinary or fantastical, that God could have taken, he came down in human form and not even fully developed, but in the most vulnerable position, as an embryo. Now, you've been learning hundreds, perhaps thousands of facts about the human body over the past two years, about the various organ systems and how they work together to allow us to be here and present and aware of the physical reality around us. We have been created with an incredible ability to grow and develop and learn and thrive and heal. And yet... You have also learned about what happens when some of these parts fail or become damaged. We become more vulnerable, frail, at risk of death. Well, Jesus himself, in taking on human form, started at that most vulnerable state, not as a full-grown man, not as a helpless baby, but as an embryo. And I guess if you want to get technical, you know, as a fertilized single cell. And he then had to go through nine months of development in the protection of his mother's womb before his birth in Bethlehem. So can you imagine the God of the universe limiting himself to be contained in a single cell? It's almost too much to wrap our heads around. And yet, I think it gives us a picture of how valuable life is right from the very beginning, even when we can't see it. So how does this transform the care we provide? It's as, I think, as stark as life and death. Now as Siddhanam says, Jesus ennobled humans with his divine dignity. So life has value and needs protecting at its earliest stages. If one does not believe in the sanctity of life from conception until natural death, well, then humans only become valuable at a certain arbitrary point. And they can also lose that value at a certain arbitrary point. And who decides? Now, I don't want to pursue the topics of abortion or euthanasia this morning. They are hot topics. They take much longer to adequately explore. And I recognize that some of us in this room a very personal experiences with abortion or euthanasia or other controversial medical subjects. And that may have left scars. Now, my reason for bringing it up, though, is that these topics and situations will arise very quickly once you are into practice. And you'll have the opportunity to show hope and charity to others in unexpected places. Something as simple as a smile or a listening ear can make the difference between life and death. 
and you'll be faced with difficult situations or asked to participate in procedures that may go against your core values or against transcendence or charity or dignity or compassion. In short, you may be asked to compromise on your moral integrity. And that's a dangerous path to creep down. So you need to fall back on that firm foundation to stand strong on what is true and noble and right. Which leads us to the last point. I'm sure you're all happy for that. All right, here we go. So finally, the compassion. Now in Sittingham's words, this is what he says. Fourthly, the, the doctor or nurse, being himself a mortal man, should be diligent and tender in relieving his suffering patients, inasmuch as he himself must one day be a like sufferer. So here we find the golden rule that we all learned in childhood and that Jesus taught in the Beatitudes. Whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. Except Jesus not only taught this, but required his followers to go much further. Turn the other cheek. You know, go the extra mile. Give your cloak also, not just your jacket. Don't do your duty. Do what is not your duty. Go beyond your duty. Compassion at its root means to suffer along with someone, to join them in the journey, and to help carry their load. And yet one of the dangers is that there's so much suffering all around that one can be drained and brought low quickly, in danger of spending oneself without the time or knowledge to recharge. And many schools are adding wellness lectures and classes on resilience, but I think these are all doomed to fail if they rely on our human efforts. There's only one who knows how to lift our burdens. Jesus calls us to learn from him and take on his yoke. When we turn to Jesus as the source of our strength, we find that we can extend that strength and comfort to others in a way that would be impossible by our own efforts. And I think this last point also touches on looking at the bigger picture, recognizing that we are all frail creatures and that life is short. Our mortal frames do not last forever. Our days are numbered. When we are young, we rarely have health concerns. And yet in a split second, any one of us can become a patient and be on the receiving end of health care. That's what Sydenham is getting at. We will all eventually need help, some sooner than others. But because of this fact, let us treat each other appropriately, coming alongside those that are struggling helping to carry each other's burdens. Don't just rush off to the next task or text message, but take the time to focus on the person in front of you, to listen and connect personally. You know, there are many industries that just try to put people through like a conveyor belt, but healthcare should not be one of them. Healing is not merely healing of the physical ailment, which is only a small part of a person, but unfortunately we spend virtually all our time attending to and learning about. Rather, true healing involves the whole person. You know, their mental state, their spiritual state, their social state, I'm sure there's others, but ultimately the state of their soul before Creator God. By coming alongside others with encouragement and love, you work on all these facets. And so, ah, I'll wrap up. Today will be a blur for many of you, a brief opportunity to celebrate together. Get some pictures, maybe some cake, and if there is, say, save some for me. But perhaps some relief that you're almost done. Just not yet. So once all the course requirements are done, the real challenge begins. This program with Prairie College is unique, trying to give you a deeper foundation for service of fellow humans than simply, I need a job or I want to help people. Rather, with Christ as the foundation and reflecting on the wisdom of Thomas Sydenham and others, you will be solid lights in the darkness. You'll be able to withstand the storms of the culture and of this broken system that we are in and point patience to the one who brings true healing, not just for the body, but for the soul. So once again, graduates, congratulations just a little longer to go. Sorry I couldn't be there in person, but I look forward to working with you at the hospital and watching you pour love and care into those in need. God bless you. Good morning. 
I'm going to explain the nursing pledge. It was written in 1893 by Lystra Gretter and committee. It was inspired by Florence Nightingale, who is the founder of modern nursing. So Andrew, whenever you're ready, we'll go. Okay. So I solemnly pledge myself before God and in the presence of this assembly to pass my life in purity and to practice my profession faithfully. This portrays accountability. And I'm, Dr. Savage and I met on Wednesday and I'm thinking, you're stealing a lot of my stuff. <laughs> so this is, it is a statement of ethics. What is good and what is bad? And principles of nursing care. The nursing profession requires high levels of dedication, kindness, and attention to detail, as well as compassion for humans in all walks of life. This first part, we've worked on the word. I will abstain from what is deleterious and mischievous. So deleterious means causing harm or damage, and mischievous is causing or showing a fondness for causing trouble in a playful way. Oh, yep, here we go. Um, and will not take or knowingly administer any harmful drug. So a nurse must be competent and is responsible for all the procedures that he or she performs and decisions he or she makes. That might be better. Uh, I will do all in my power to maintain and elevate the standard of my profession. So the first part of this, the Nurses' Code of Professional Conduct stipulates that all nurses must treat a patient with dignity, respect, and compassion, regardless of the nature of the health condition, economic status, gender, race, culture, relig religious beliefs, or personal attributes. The code strictly enforces that all patients are worth the dignity and rights of human beings and so should not be discriminated against for any reason while under a nurse's care, even when it poses a personal conflict of interest. The second part of this about um, accountability or the standard of my profession, the nurse should constantly seek new knowledge to improve their nursing practice and will hold in confidence all personal matters committed to my keeping. Nurses must also protect the patient's right to privacy. Information must be confidential and not divulged to anybody unless they are permitted to do so by the patient. And all family affairs coming to my knowledge in the practice of my calling. They must also never allow their personal issues or beliefs to come in the way of delivering quality health care to their patients. With loyalty, I will endeavor to aid the physician in his work. So teamwork. We all need each other to provide the best care for the patient and devote myself to the welfare of those committed to my care. The Nurses' Code of Professional Conduct encourages them to provide fair, safe, and ethical treatment for all patients. Class of 2022, would you please stand and recite the pledge with me? I solemnly pledge myself before God and in the presence of this assembly to pass my life in purity and to practice my profession faithfully. Louder. Stain from what is yeah, and mischievous, and will not take or administer any harmful drug. I will do all in my power to maintain and elevate the standard of my profession, and will hold in confidence all personal matters committed to my keeping, and all family affairs coming to my knowledge in the practice of my calling. With loyalty will I endeavor to aid the physician in his work and devote myself to the welfare of those committed to my care. Please be seated. Thank you, Jan. To the pinning ceremony. A pinning ceremony is a symbolic welcoming of student nurses 
into the nursing profession. It signifies the completion of their educational requirements that enable you to take your nursing exams. The history of nursing pins dates back to the Crusades in the 12th century. Monks initiated the Knights Hospitaller that cared for injured and ill crusaders who were given a Maltese cross, which was considered to be the first form of a badge given for nursing. After the Crimean War in the mid-1800s, Queen Victoria uh, awarded Florence Nightingale the Royal Red Cross for her service as a military nurse during the conflict. Nightingale later presented a somewhat similar Medal of Excellence to her nursing students. Pinning ceremonies often include a candle lighting or a lamp lighting which commemorates Nightingale's nighttime aid to the wounded soldiers by candlelight. Thus, she became known as the Lady of the Lamp. The psalmist in Psalm 119, speaking of God, says this, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. As each of you step forward to center stage for the pinning. You will also receive a Bible from Gideon's International. It's our desire as faculty and staff of Prairie College that as graduates, you would go forward being God's lamp and his light in a world of hurt and suffering. Presenting the graduates, Zhu Hyun Kim, Seoul, South Korea. Jillian Parrish, Red Deer, Alberta. Megan McKenzie, Drumheller, Alberta. <laughs> Brittany Blanjou, Busby, Alberta. Samantha Bookwitz, Three Hills, Alberta.
Amanda Rempel, Okotoks, Alberta. Amy Neldret, Abbotsford, British Columbia. Robin Jesperson, Spruce Grove, Alberta. Caitlin Doherty, Airdrie, Alberta. Caitlin Stiles, Edson, Alberta. Alana Mannerfeld, Red Deer, Alberta. And unable to be here, but hopefully online, Rachel Debray from Sexsmith, Alberta. Good morning. Uh, my name is Alana Mannerfelt, and I have the honor to be able to give this speech today on behalf of my wonderful class here. Thank you all for coming to Three Hills. I know it was probably a drive for a lot of you. Um, thank you for coming here to support us today. As everyone here knows that the students are thankful for much more than just one day of support. As you may have witnessed, it has taken a lot of hard work, prayers, and some tears to get to this point and maybe a few more tears. 
Even with all that, we wouldn't have been here without the support we've received from you today. It has been a blessing to attend Prairie and to be able to pursue our dream of becoming a nurse. Here we, sorry, <laughs> here we're able to grow in our faith and our relationship with God while also learning how to incorporate our spiritual lives into our new career. Even though it has been hectic, being a part of the nursing program while attending Bible classes, oh, sorry, that was kind of, um, it's been hectic while doing their nursing classes and attending the Bible classes. The association of Bow Valley College and Prairie College is so special because it allows us to combine our spiritual-based education with a top-notch nursing program. And to my fellow graduates, I have enjoyed our time together and hope we will all cherish the friendships we've made. I know we will. We have had a lot of tough times together, but even more greater times. Together, we made it through lab evals, somewhat finished what seemed to be a never-ending line of essays, and have successfully finished two of our clinicals. Proverbs, 19, or Proverbs 16, 9 says, In their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. As we move forward, just remember that the cohort you have here is a part of God's plan for each one of us, and that you will always have the family you have made at Prairie to support you because we love you. And, of course, Jan and Kyla, I know that you will always remember us. We will always hold the title of your quietest class <laughs> you've ever had. <laughs> yeah. Somehow, you got an entire class of students who did not want to be the first ones to talk first. Your questions were also followed by several minutes of silence and funny looks. But don't worry, we often knew the answer. <laughs> um, I promise you, we were listening. <laughs> we were just too hesitant to say anything, and somehow this lasted two years. <laughs> we are sorry about that. <laughs> I'd like to thank Jan and Kyla. It has been incredible to be able to be taught and mentored by two people who have such a passion for nursing as well as teaching. Your care for us has been so evident over these years. You are not only great teachers, but you are an amazing team because your strengths complement each other. Kyla, your love, <laughs> your love for knowledge and growth is inspirational. You, are always, you always know how to make a complicate, complicated information more relatable. Jan, your love of people is amazing. <laughs> you are always able to use your practice and knowledge um, to help us prepare, prepare for our future in nursing and inform us of many different situations that we might face in the future. Even outside of the classroom, you both have been so kind and loving. Always open to talking when we are feeling overwhelmed, whether it was school-related or not. Anything that was weighing on us, they were open to listening to us and lend us an ear. You, together as a team, is truly what made this program so great. Thank you, and I can't say that enough. You both have been truly a blessing on all of our lives, and we promise we'll visit soon. If you'd like to come up, we do have some flowers for you.
I just wanted to introduce Petrina Mackey, who has joined us and is the interim dean of nursing at Bull Valley College. So if you want to just wave and everyone look at, yeah. It's my privilege to just be able to bring this time to a close by praying for all of you. Uh, join with me in prayer. God, we're so grateful. We're so thankful for each one of these graduates, for the complexity of their lives and their gifts and the stories that they've uh, had before they came here to Prairie and the stories that are that they've written these uh, last couple of years and the stories they'll go on to, to write. God, we thank you that they're part of your grand story of love and redemption. We celebrate with you and we are uh, so grateful for designing them to be uh, the wonderful caregivers that you've made them to be. God, we ask for your help. We all continually need you and these women need you as they're finishing up they need you, and they need your provision and your grace and as they move into the workplace, uh, in their relationships in the workplace, in their uh, in difficulties that they'll face as they try to give care in very challenging times and very difficult times, as they wrestle with their own uh, stress and anxiousness and exhaustion. God, we ask that you would uh, please protect them. And God, we pray that you would... Uh, Help them to be the hands and feet of Jesus, pointing people to your love in embodied ways as they care and, and as they listen and as they uh, relate in love to those that they are uh, in charge of. And God, I, uh, I want to use this prayer from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, um, and I pray this over them. I pray that out of God's glorious riches... He may strengthen all of you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you all, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all that we can ask or imagine according to his power that's at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. It's my honor to present to you the graduating class of 2022. We love you all. There's a chance for a photo uh, here. Um, I believe the next stage is you all are going to just gather briefly for a photo. Uh, and then please feel free after that initial photo is taken to take whatever photos you'd like. Uh, and we are officially done. Thank you all for being here.